Hello, everyone, and welcome to ACP's live remote non-CE offering. I'm Lynn Forney, and I'll be the moderator for today's non-CE course. Today's non-CE topic is indications and contraindications with head and neck pens applications, and it will last approximately 30 minutes. It's now my pleasure to introduce Rebecca Clickerman, who will be our presenter today. Rebecca is an SLP and a clinical program consultant for ACP. Take it away, Rebecca. Thank you, Lynn. So as Lynn stated, we are here to provide an overview of the contraindications, warnings, and precautions um, of head and neck pens. And although the contraindications, warnings, precautions um, that we're going to review today will cover all uses of pens, we're really specifically going to highlight some of those specifically pertaining to um, the head and neck protocol utilized by speech language pathologists. I want to start by defining what the contraindications, warnings, and precautions are. So this is a handout that is available that provides just an overview of how devices are labeled by the Food and Drug Administration, um, requiring all manufacturers to provide proof of safety, safety and efficacy for devices. So this provides a nice overview, but what it also includes are the specific definitions for what a contraindication, warning, and precaution are. So contraindications are going to describe situations in which the device should not be used because the risk of use clearly outweighs any possible benefit or a condition which makes a particular treatment or procedure inadvisable. Only known hazards and not theoretical possibilities are to be listed and death or serious injury may result from the use of the device for a contraindicated application. So clearly contraindications would um, limit use of a device and you would not be advised to use the device with a patient under those situations. A warning is going to describe a serious adverse reaction, potential safety hazards, limitations in use imposed by them, and steps that should be taken to prevent them from occurring. So warning is included if there's reasonable evidence of an association of a serious hazard with the use of the device. Warning is appropriate when the device is commonly used for a disease or condition for which there is lack of valid scientific evidence of effectiveness for that disease or condition and such usage is associated with a serious risk or hazard. Precautions are going to include information regarding any type of special care that the clinician and or patient should exercise to ensure the safety and effective use of the device. This is going to include general device uh, considerations, safety considerations for the user and or the patient. So I wanted to provide a nice review of that so you understand, you know, a contraindication is really going to restrict use in those situations. Warnings are things to consider and understand that there could be potential uh, safety hazards and precautions are going to be things that advise you on how um, you and the patient should use uh, the device. So I'm going to share with you our contraindications reference. And if you have completed uh, training in use of head and neck the head and neck pens protocol, you should have been provided the contraindications, warnings, precautions matrix. This is a shortened, abbreviated version of that. And the full matrix will include descriptions of each of these contraindications, warnings, precautions that I'm going to review. So for head neck pens, a pacemaker or implanted defibrillator would be a contraindication. This is an absolute contraindication because it may cause electric shock, burns, electrical interference, or death. 
Also a contraindication would include medical, implanted medical devices. Examples are going to include a cochlear implant, a deep brain stimulator, spinal cord stimulators, infusion pumps. And even if the device is not used, I, I get this question fairly often. So a patient may have a deep brain stimulator or cochlear implant um, in place, but it's not used, or maybe a portion of the, the device was actually removed. Often those lead wires are left implanted. So even if the implant's removed or it's not being used, the presence of those lead wires would remain a contraindication. Electrical stimulation on patients with implanted metallic or electronic devices should not be used and it may cause electric shock, burns, electrical interference, or death. Note, there is no contraindication um, to the application of transcutaneous electrical stimulation or powered muscle stimulation over metal implants. Now, external stimulator systems have a warning if you are providing the electrical stimulation over top of that, that area. So the e-stim should not be applied directly over an external stimulator that has lead wires. Now here you'll see active cancer is listed as a warning with the description directly over. So use of e-stim should not be applied over or in close proximity to active cancer as it may increase blood to the tumor. So we know that that pens um, should increase blood circulation. Now cancer in the other and other areas of the body would be a warning and you always want to consider where that placement is going to be in proximity to a tumor the presence of cancer. So similarly with pregnancy, you'll see that descriptor of over uterus. Now with the head and neck pens protocol, we're not getting anywhere close to the uterus, but you should be aware that um, ESTEM is not advised to be um, used over the uterus and the safety of electrical stimulation um, during pregnancy has not been established. So that would be something that's a warning if you do have a patient that is pregnant. The ones that say not applicable are clearly not applicable. Fever, infection, and inflammation are going to be warnings. So treatment should not be applied if the patient has a high fever. It should not be applied over swollen areas or if the patient has severe infection. So consider osteomyelitis, sepsis, TB. And then the e stim should also not be applied over inflamed areas or skin um, eruptions. And you should always do that skin check and check your patient's uh, medical status prior to implementing the use of the head and neck pens protocol. Hemorrhage and active bleeding are precautions. So again, consider your patient and the situation. You should use caution when a patient has a tendency to bleed internally, such as you know, following an injury or a fracture. Now the cranial region is a warning. Use the protocols that are recommended in the head and neck pens course. They're placed on, on the cheeks, on either the masseters or the buccals, if you're using that oral placement or the masseters and the cervical pelvis spinal. You're not actually putting it on the cranial region and that would not be advised. Eastim should not be applied transcranially. Reproductive organs would also be a warning. We're not applying the Eastim over the testes. Again, if we're utilizing that head and neck protocol, it should not be a concern. Now the eyes, we're not applying pens over the eyes. And it's also advised that you place the pads and maybe um, alter the placement so that you're not getting, you know, above that cheekbone too close to the patient's eyes as well. DVT would also be a warning. So do not apply the e stim directly or in close proximity to deep brain vein thrombosis. Also avoid use of e stim in any tissue following an acute DVT if, when the thrombosis is not um, completely resolved as well. And the same thing for the heart, you're not going to provide e stim over the heart. And if the patient has cardiac disease, you would want to consult with the patient's physician for using Easton. There is concern that, you know, the device could cause lethal rhythm disturbances 
to the heart in susceptible individuals. Healing bone and tissue is another precaution, something to consider. You should use caution in the presence of recent surgical procedures, fractures, or healing bone and soft tissue. So if the patient has an area that is recovering from surgery or injury, may want to hold treatment in that area if the muscle contraction may actually disrupt that healing process. So good conversation to have with the patient's physician. Again, always important to look at skin integrity and the overall health of our patient prior to providing head and neck pain. Now, lead wires are listed as contraindication because you always would want to use manufacturer recommended or supplied or approved lead wires, and you always want to check for the integrity of those wires. You want to make sure they're not frayed, they're not split, they're not damaged in any sort of, of way. If so, you would want to not use that wire and get a replacement prior to providing um, the head and neck pens protocol. So the device user manual is listed as a warning because we should not provide head and neck pens until we have reviewed the user manual, you've been trained, gone through the CE portion and the lab portion. So you understand all the indications for use of the device and understand these contraindications, warnings, and precautions prior to providing the application. So application to the neck here is listed as a warning. In the head and neck pens protocol, you are placing uh, the electrodes on the posterior portion of the neck. This application to the neck listing is outlining that the electrodes should not be applied over the carotid sinus, and that would be in the anterior neck triangle. So that includes the vagus nerve, laryngeal pharyngeal muscles. You're not going to apply it over the patient's anterior neck. Um, it could cause severe muscle spasms that could re then result in closure of the airway, difficulty breathing or even adverse effects on heart rhythm or blood pressure. So keep in mind, again, that the head and neck pins protocol, the electrodes are never going on the anterior portion in the neck. You're always going over the um, cervical paraspinals. Diathermy, especially if you're using head and neck pens in a busy gym, you want to ensure that diathermy is not in use in close proximity. And that would be defined as, as less than five feet. You always want to make sure that ensure there's some space between a patient receiving diathermy and your patient receiving pens. And clearly this is, you know, your patient, if your patient's receiving diathermy, you would not want to simultaneously provide um, the PENS protocol. Menstruation um, should not be too concerning because we're not going to be treating anywhere in that area for head and neck, but it's good to know that you should not apply ESTEM over the lumbar or abdominal region or over the uterus during menstruation, as this could actually result in a temporary increase of menstrual flow. Monitoring equipment is a warning if it's anywhere on the body. So the e-stim should not be applied to patients connected to monitoring equipment as the stimulation may have an effect on proper operation of the monitoring equipment. So it's going to depend where that monitoring equipment is, how close the proximity is to that head and neck pens protocol that we are providing. Circulation and sensation are precautions. So if you are providing it to an area that has reduced sensation or circulation, you really want to take that into consideration with your patient. You want to take caution if your patient has reduced sensation in a particular area, you would not want to increase that intensity too high. So you would want to compare it to more intact areas prior to providing pens to those reduced areas. Conductive mediums are going to also be listed as precautions. The use of conductive mediums such as gels, lotions, are not advised if they're not provided. So the pet, the oval electrodes for the head and neck pens protocols have that hydrogel on the back. 
Um, so you should, you should not require any additional type of medium and it's not advised to pair additional ones as well. The long-term effects of um, e-STEM are really unknown and that's why it's, it's listed as a warning. Skin preparation is also listed as a warning. If you've completed the training already, you should know that skin prep is very important component of the head and neck pens protocol. We need to make sure that we do a skin inspection prior to setting up the electrodes. We need to apply only to um, normal, intact, clean, healthy skin. If the area is broken, if it has an infection or a rash, we would not want to provide it over that area. Always follow the protocols for skin preparation. Remember, if the skin is overly dried or um, overly oiled, it's going to provide resistance and possible discomfort to our patients as well. Patient activity should be pretty self-explanatory, but it's important to ensure that um, we're not using this, we're only using this in a safe uh, situation or environment. So don't use this if a patient's sleeping. Do not provide ESTIM while the patient is in the bath or the shower. Obviously, that would be a safety concern. But also if your patient is driving, operating machinery, or really in any activity that could them at injury or risk. So if I'm trying to pair pens with something else, I want to make sure that I'm providing an instant in a safe situation. So I don't want to set up my patient to complete one task with pens running and pens actually interferes with their completion of that task or the muscle contractions impair their ability to complete that task. You should always make sure that the unit, whether it's the FX2 portable unit or the Omniversa are not accessible to children or unqualified persons only those who are trained should really be providing the head and neck pens protocol. And the prescribing practitioner, if is also a precaution, and it's something that you know, we should be having those conversations with uh, nursing the physician and putting in that clarification order so that everybody's aware we're providing pens as part of our skilled treatment. And if our patient does have any of these warnings or precaution situations that we're having a, a conversation with that prescribing practitioner. Electrode placement and removal are also really important, just like the electrode place, the skin and <laughs> check, sorry. We always want to make sure that, you know, not only have we set up the patient and cleaned their skin appropriately, we want to make sure that we're placing the electrodes safely on the body and removing them. And one point to make with the electrode placement is the electrodes should not be placed in direct contact or in close proximity. So one inch or less to each other during treatment. This can actually lead to high energy density and skin burns either under or between the electrodes. So we always want to make sure that, that there's that gap between the electrodes. Always make sure you're not just pulling the electrodes off of the skin. You're really walking your fingers down as you're gently removing the electrodes from the patient's skin. Again, skin inspection should always occur prior to and following treatment. You always want to look for um, any signs of tearing or irritation and document and report if that did occur. Epilepsy is listed as a precaution, and this is going to be a patient-by-patient -patient basis. You're going to follow the precautions recommended by the patient's physician. Would want to look at the patient's history, have that um, consultation with the physician. Hypersensitivity um, is listed as a precaution because we should take caution with patients who are exhibiting any sort of psychological or physical hypersensitivity to the treatment. You can make attempts. Um, sometimes I as a clinician, even like to demonstrate the protocol myself if, to help put patients at ease so they can see what's involved with the treatment, you know, and, and that we're only going for that, that consistent muscle twitch, no, no type of tetany. If my patient does experience hypersensitivity, you can actually reduce that intensity, see if you can gain some other confidence, cooperation, but you know, if they are in fact too hypersensitive, it may not be advised to use with that patient. But there are steps that you can take to really gain the patient's participation and their, their comfort as well.
You always want to monitor how they're tolerating the treatment. So you want to check their skin, look for any sort of changes. You want to check in with that patient consistently, ensuring they're not experiencing pain or any overheating during the treatment. Obviously, discontinue the treatment if the patient is experiencing some overheating or discomfort. And you can also turn down that intensity or even adjust those phase durations to accommodate for any sort of sensitivity that the patient has. You should always look for and know if your patient's receiving any sort of medicated patches, salves and creams, making sure that we're not placing the pads over them, you know, in, in direct contact, you know, this may alter the patient's sensation. And the hot and cold packs, we really obviously don't want to provide head and neck pens under a heat pack or a cold pack. But also if that patient has just recently received treatment, you know, heat or cold treatment, we may want to wait and hold pens application until after those effects have worn off because sensation may be altered if that patient just received a hot or cold pack. Obviously, you only want to use ACP approved accessories, power cords, and supplies. Your unit should be maintained and calibrated and do not service or attempt to repair the unit yourself. It is absolutely not advised. Only a qualified um, person should be performing any sort of service or repairs. So there is obviously a, a shock hazard as well if you were to attempt to repair it and open up that unit yourself. For cleaning, it's advised to obviously not submerge the device in water and not clean the unit with water. There is infection control section of the unit user manual, but you would want to clean the device with approved cleaning supplies, disinfecting wipes. That for output intensity, it's listed as a precaution because you want to gradually increase the intensity for your patient. You want to make sure it's comfortable. And again, we're going for a twitch and we don't want to provide any higher intensity to elicit that twitch than is really necessary. So you always want to gradually increase the intensity. And then combination treatment, you would not want to combine use of pens simultaneously with any other sort of device. You would not want to connect it to any other sort of electrical equipment for any sort of combination therapy. And this is not something that we as SLPs would run into so much because we don't really use ultra sound or diatherapy or anything like that, but something to advise if you were, let's say, co-treating with a PT or OT, you would really only be providing that head and neck pens protocol. So this was intended to be just a general overview of the head and neck pens, contraindications, warnings, precautions. Thank you all.